would think if you were naive, you could get played. But I think I had this like innocence and also kindness to me that, and I do believe there was like an angel on my shoulders, like guiding me. Mm -hmm. Cause there were some situations that I would be just like, mm, this doesn't feel right. I didn't know why it just didn't feel right. And I would just like leave later. I'd find out something that was to happen. Well, hello there. And welcome to this episode of the Terry Cole show. I just had the most fun interviewing my pal, Josie Bissette for the Terry Cole show. You may know her. She is a multi-talented artist, author. She's a proud mama. She's best known for her role as Jane Mancini on the iconic TV series, Melrose Place. Josie has captivated audiences worldwide with her talent and charm. Yes, she has. There's so much more to Josie than um, Melrose, but I sort of had this connection to her in Melrose, which we talk about on the show, how I knew her before I knew her as a talent agent, and then how we reconnected recently. Um, she's also an author. She's still acting. She has a really well-known kids book called The Tickle Monster, which we talk about as well. She's just great. I loved this conversation. She's so real. She's so down to earth. I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Josie Bissett as much as I enjoyed talking to my friend. I am so excited to welcome my pal, Josie Bissett, to the Terry Cole Show. Josie, welcome. Thank you, Terry. It's so good to see your face. I know. It's, it's so, so funny. Long. You guys, before we before we flipped this on, we were trying to remember when was the last time we saw each other? Like what 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 was happening? Where were we? And I really we really think it was when I was an agent at Cunningham Escott Slevin and Doherty a billion and five years ago. But anyway, yeah. small world and here we are. Yay. And welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you. I was just telling you off off camera how much I love your book and how I've I think I've probably watched every podcast now that you've have had out and you're just so, um, just so real. And I've really enjoyed and learned so much so far. So thank you. Sure. I'm so happy yeah. to, be, to reconnect in, in this incarnation, because really both of us have, we've got had second and third acts in our lives and in our careers. So I want to talk a little bit about you like, so, so going back to the beginning, what inspired you to act? So you are in Melrose Place. I want to hear a little bit about that experience. And then, you know, you've done movies since then, but, but what inspired you from the beginning? Did you always want to be an actress? Was that always a part of your thing or no? No. So I had always wanted to be a fashion designer and crazy, a crazy thing is that Jane, um, Melrose Place character, Jane, was a fashion designer. So it was very, pretty cool that that got to kind of come around. Um, and I wanted to go to a design school. And so I started modeling when I was 12. And um, then when I was 16, I got, I went to Japan to model. And then that, that led me to LA because the roommate I had in Japan lived in Santa Monica and she invited me to stay at her grandma's house. I lived I lived month to month for a year. I lived on couches. I slept in closets. I, I mean, people don't realize what, you know, what it, when someone gets to a certain level in their career, like how long and how hard, you know, you really, people really do work to get, to get somewhere. Then I started modeling and then naturally uh, that led to commercials and then commercials led to like people reading scripts. I'm like, what are they doing? Like they're, you know, Oh, they're like, you know, I mean, I am a 17 year old from Seattle. I've never, I, the thing I think that helped me is I was super naive. Like, well, why can't I do this? I didn't know if I had known how, you know, how difficult it really is to make a career out of it. I probably wouldn't have done it, but I was like, well, yeah. So just why can't I get this? And then because I was confident and didn't see why I wouldn't. And, and I, I got it. And I think a lot of it, Terry, is also like right place, right time, luck, naivety. Like it just, it's all sort of fell into place, which um, it wasn't something I was planning. But then once I was right. started acting, I liked it. I'm pretty type A when it comes to work. Like I love working. I don't feel like it's work. I could do it all day, all night. You know, that's kind mm -hmm. of a boundary thing too. I'm learning is when to turn that off. Right. 
because it's hard for me and especially just in the situation I'm at. My husband's living in Atlanta and I'm in Seattle. So I'm alone a lot and I work a lot, which I like. So I, I have to try to find balance and I have to right. have boundaries within myself. So I'm learning that. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's kind of how it started. And then I, I started working as an actress and then Melrose came along. First, I got the show called The Hogan Family. And it was right. a yeah sitcom with uh, Sandy Duncan and Jason Bateman. Um, I was on that for a couple of years. And then I got Melrose Place. And as we know, that went on for like seven years. Um, and then... So kids. how was that yeah. experience? Like, how was the Melrose experience? Because it was really a phenomenon for, for those sort of in my age group. Yeah. It's like everybody. Like, it was the thing yeah. that everyone did. We, everyone was like, where are we watching Melrose? Right. right? So it was, right. it was like, it was like Dallas and like, uh, mm. Knott's Landing. And, you know, there were certain shows that the teen 20 girls would, would be like, this is, they were our soap operas, right? They were our nighttime yeah. soaps. So I know you probably have a very devoted following of people who just loved you then and love you now. Yeah. Um, but what was that like for you at the height of Melrose. Yeah. We we were sort of protected in this. We worked so much that however the group the cast was so large. So it was it was a great show because we we did work a lot but we also none of us had to carry the show. Right. So if there was a storyline failing or if the fail didn't, I mean the show didn't go well, it wasn't just one per person's fault, which was which was great. And there was no social media, remember back then. Mm -hmm. So I feel, you know, there, and that's good and bad, right? Like, a, I kind of wish we had that ability to get those numbers back then, but I think it really would have changed, changed everything. We just worked and we didn't, because of the age, our age, we were very, um, well, like the 90210 group, they were younger, so they were going out more and maybe in the news with that kind of stuff, but we were getting married, we were having kids. So we were, we were very in that stage of our life too, where we were professional and on time. And, um, yeah. we all sort of hit that success at the same time. There wasn't one person except for Heather Locklear, who was, you know, super famous before that. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. And when I look back at all the press, I'm like, wow, but a lot of it, I just, it's a blur. And sometimes I don't remember, some of it, which is, you know, how that can be. I don't remember being somewhere, but it was just so much at one time. And I've just always stayed myself and grounded. I think it's just because I have a, a very strong, close-knit family and always keep myself grounded in that way with them and going back to Seattle during that time. And, and then yeah, I got married. So you, right, but you left Cali. So you, so you left LA in 2001 or 2002? I left in 2002, yeah. Or yeah. three. Yeah. Yeah. So I was pregnant with Mason. I was five months pregnant with Mason when the show ended. And it was so great because <laughs> I didn't have to make that choice to leave the show. Right. Because uh, I definitely didn't want to work after I had, I wanted to be able to be with him, not, you know, sometimes those early morning hours. Like I just didn't want to not see him go to bed and wake up. And, and so, um, it was just perfect that I didn't have to make that choice. Um, and that was sort of the segue into me writing books was that when I had my kids, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go back to acting yet, but I was dying for something creative. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I dove into to writing. Yeah. So were, are all of your books, kids books? So my first two, and we we're not publishing them anymore, but the first two were called Little Bits of Wisdom and Making Memories. And they were, I would reached out and this was also before social media. So it was, it was funny. It was like, I would talk to like parenting magazine and they would put an article in the magazine saying, you know, Josie wants to know what your favorite memory is that you've made as a family. Please share that. It's something you'd love to share with someone else is specifically yours. So I got all the thousands of, you know, write-ins um, and I love doing that because I think traditions are really important for kids and for mm -hmm. family. And then the little bits of wisdom was the same format. I was in a mommy and me group and I was like, this is fucking hard. Like, <laughs> I mean, I've always wanted to have a kid, but this is hard. I remember just the, the sleep deprivation was just killer. 
And, um, mm. and I remember being pregnant with my second one going, how am I going to do this? You know, people have a lot of babies and stuff, but I gave like everything I had to Mason, like everything I just, and then I was like, how do I split the love and how do I do that? You know, and it just happens naturally, but little bits of wisdom came from that. Just there's so much to learn. And I felt like I was learning so much from the moms in the group so much more than any doctor, more than any book. It was just like hands-on. What are you doing when this happens? What do you do when this happens? Um, and so that's what the book is. It's just all just bits of wisdom from parent to parent. Like, what do you wish you would have known? And so then I did Tickle Monster. Yeah. And I wrote that when Mason was two. I love this so much though. Yeah. I have though, those of you who are watching this here, I just want you to look how beautiful this, there's like a Tickle Monster kit and it's so gorgeous and Hey, still time before the holiday. You yeah. can order it. We're going to leave every, we're going to put everything in the show notes. Where can they normally order them? Joseebeset.com. Oh, J-O-S-I-E. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's E-T-T. And it'll be on there, but yeah, it, I got the tag on, but you can tickle the child as you read the book. And I wrote it because when I would put Mason to sleep, I read him, I would read to him and then I'd go get in bed. And I was like, one night I was like, oh my gosh. I, they're so cute. He's like, I go, I don't, I can't really even remember what I read to him. I was thinking about my to-do list, all the things I have to do. Da, da, da. I'm like, I wasn't present with him at all. Like, does he feel right. that? So then I started playing this tickle monster game and he just loved the attention. Da, da, da. And then that just turned into to the book. Yeah. And, and the book has actually won a lot of awards and it's really parent sort of approved, let's say, but yeah. you've, you know, this is, you, you, it's been around for a long time and people really love it. So you guys, if you need a gift, so age appropriate, what, what do you say this is age appropriate for Tickle Monster? Yeah. The cool thing about this book and why it continues to do well. Is so it's so universal. Like our kids love, most kids like to be tickled if they're not tickled too crazy. It can be from, you know, an infant to when they're able to figure it out. Up to yeah. six, like, you know, yeah. up till when they're, they're done with it. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'm offering, I'd like to offer your audience, anyone who hears this, uh, a signed copy. So if you have someone special or someone that's having a baby or a grandma or, or papa, and we'll put those in the show notes of how to order that. Oh, that's such a beautiful, um, that's such a beautiful gift and getting something that is signed. It's like a limited edition yeah. type of a feel. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love the idea of giving it to someone who's pregnant. It's like a perfect yes. gift for a baby shower, you know? Yes. Really sweet. Yes. Yep. And grandmas yeah. and grandpas seem to love it too. Just something to do with them. And yeah. All right. So, so then now that let's move into, so yeah writing, still loving writing. I know that you love fashion. I know that you've also been doing different movies, different Hallmark movies. You, you reconnected with Jack Wagner yeah. on a movie in 2021, I think it was, right? So tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, sort of dabbling, going back into the acting thing and then back into your creative life in a different way. Yeah, sure. So after Melrose, then I had, like I said, I had Mason and Maya move to Seattle so I could raise them here because they have lots of cousins. And and then I got a show um, for ABC Family. It was called The Secret Life of the American Teenager. It was with mm -hmm. Megan Park and Shailene Woodley. Um, and I played a mom on that show. And it was awesome because I could live in Seattle. And Brenda Hampton, who created it, she um, would compile all my scenes into a couple days. And then I would fly and work. And I had like my luggage and the, I didn't even have to bring anything. I would stay at the same hotel and I would go and work when their dad had the kids. So I wouldn't would miss my week with them. I was able to like be hundred percent present, not stressed about work. And then the week I didn't have them, I got to go travel and work, which was just the best schedule. That was Amazing. for five years. Yeah. I loved that. And then, um, and then after that, yes, I did a lot of Hallmark movies and I did this series of movies with Jack Wagner called Wedding March. I think we did six, six of them. And that was just so much fun. That really showed and taught me sort of what I do love to do because Melrose, Melrose was so 
like a comedy dramedy. I mean, it became really just outlandish. And and then poor Jane, like my character was always the one that had to go through something. So I had a lot of emotional stuff. It's just like, no more. Yeah, I did. I did. And I, I just didn't want to do that anymore. And so these movies were just romantic comedy. And I just loved it. I had so much fun. Just so much better on my soul. Like, whew. Yeah. You know, and and the setup, the setup for that was, you know, you guys owned an inn in Vermont and then people coming in and getting married and then eventually you guys getting married. Yes. But, but for you, where did you actually shoot that? We shot that in uh, Canada, Vancouver area. So for me, great. it was great. Just a couple hour drive and yeah, beautiful, beautiful scenery there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot yeah. of fun. We're done with that, but we're hoping to move it to a different network. I'm not quite sure. Hallmark had a lot of changes going on. So from the original cast, who I know you're still close with Daphne Zuniga, um, mm-hmm. who who else do you sort of keep in touch with on a regular basis? Let's yeah, say. well, I saw Daphne, I saw uh, Grant show um, not too long ago. And I hadn't seen him f- forever, like since that uh, e-weekly shoot that we all did. And that was for the Comic-Con. Um, yeah. And then I chat with Laura some, you know, every now and then. Mm-hmm. And who else? That's it, really. And, of course, Jack. And, you know, every once in a while, well, there'll be a chain of everyone talking about something. But, um, right. yeah, yeah. It's so amazing. And so, and then Comic-Con, was that 2022? Yeah, that was, that was fun. I mean, mo- my favorite part was get to see them. And I've never done that before. So, the whole thing was just a setup I've never experienced before with the standing line, people holding cash, paying cash for a photo, which is different, but I loved it, loved it. And I loved the people we were in Pittsburgh and they were just the kindest, like, you know, sometimes your line's not long or there's nobody. And then the next person next to you could have one going out the door. It just depends on the time, you know, whatever. And I, Jack warned me about that. He was like, don't feel bad if, you're no one's in your line for a little while. Right. I'm like, Oh my God. Right. So I'm like, that happened. I was like sweating. Like, what do I do with myself? You know, I don't want to get on the phone because that's rude. But I also like, right. and um, I could see people notice and they would come over and they were like, Oh, you looked, you know, they knew that I was alone, but they didn't want it. They didn't, they weren't a big fan. They didn't want a photo. I wasn't someone they wanted a photo from, but it was um, yeah. Just cause they had heard it was my first one. And so they were just so kind and, and they're, they're such a great group because they're all there for the same thing and uh, get each right. other. And it's quite a system. Yeah. I enjoyed it. How was it for you though, to sort of connect with, cause I imagine, you know, you live in Seattle, I mean, Atlanta too. So, so you're in, yeah. you're in both cities, but it's like for you to connect with sort of diehard fans who, yeah. who remember the episodes mm-hmm. who it's like a, time capsule in some ways yeah of your life right seven years of your life your life experience even though that's just your work life right your real life was also going on at the same time but I always find it so so fascinating in having a lot of um like highly visible clients let's say Mm -hmm. depending on what they're highly visible for how what what these stands or the these diehard fans how they know everything they remember everything they it's it's really something like, I don't know. What, is. What, what is your experience of that? Yeah, it is really something. It's um, there was one fan who flew from France. He had gotten there that day and was leaving that day. And he only he came just to meet Grant, Daphne and I. And I mean, talk about mm-hmm. diehard fan. He was just so kind. And um, yeah, so we I gave him a book and he got all his signatures and stuff. And then we was back off to France. But I think part of it is, and I know this happens with probably all the shows, but I feel like Melrose in that time frame was unique because people, like you said, got together to watch and yep. there was no recording. There was no, like you had to watch it. You had, you got together. So there you're making memories, you're creating time with someone. And so those memories are even more special than just watching it alone. And I think that's what makes it just a little bit more special for people is that it was a time in life that we'll never have that way again. No, we won't. Yeah. It, it's interesting you say that because when you think about from a psychological and an emotional point of view, that when you're waiting for something, 
like we're anticipating, we're thinking about like, oh, when there's a cliffhanger, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait until next week. But here's the thing. You had to wait until you next week to. or next season. Yes. Like there was no binging. And so again, yeah. for us, with me and my girlfriends, we made it a whole thing. Somebody yeah. was making dinner. It was going to be at your place. It was going to be, right? So yeah. you, you, the shared experience, and I feel like the way that a lot of us are streaming now, and I find myself doing it less. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. interesting. I've had this experience sort of since the pandemic where I feel like during the pandemic, I was under so much stress writing a book. My mother was sick with cancer. She's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank God. But oh, it was good. Just, oh, thank God. But, yeah. you know, like everyone, we didn't know what was happening. We, this is especially before the vaccines. Yeah. Where it was just so, and I live in the middle of friggin' nowhere, thank God. Yeah. So I'm in the country with my geese. Okay. And my, you know, That's this is what happened for me. Normal people during the pandemic were like, I learned how to make sourdough bread. And somehow I became yeah. like a backyard farmer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Oh, I was like, I'm going to learn French. I'm going to learn how to play, play the guitar. I didn't do any of it. I wish, though, if I could have it back, man. <laughs> right. But yes, but I decided at that time, listen, no more, even though I'm obsessed with like, you know, serial killer movies and shit. I was like, <laughs> I'm I have to stop watching. Yeah. Like real life is stressful enough. So from there on in, I've been listening to books on tape, way less watching television. And if I am watching anything, I'm watching stand up comedy or watching stuff from the past that yeah. I know doesn't have anything horrible that's going to make me yeah. have bad dreams, you know? Right. That's good. Yeah. I don't watch anything um, that's scary or like killer stuff. Like my daughter, she wants to be a forensic nurse. She mm -hmm. loves, she will, there could be like a whodunit. And she's like, no, that didn't, she knows who did it. She's just so good at it. She just loves yeah. it. It doesn't affect her, but I'm like, it like wrecks my soul. Like my spirit is so sensitive to yeah. stuff like that and the visuals and uh, I just can't do it. Yeah. So that's probably good. I take that out of your life. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I think stand up comedy is the way to go. Yes. Um, yes. In, in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about Hollywood to a degree in the way of boundaries. Like you were in Hollywood. And like you said, I, I think there really is something to what you're saying about being young and not caring that much. Like, you didn't, yeah. it wasn't like a calculated thing. It was like, mm -hmm. you didn't know. You thought, yeah. why not me? Right. Which is what we, we work to think now. Why not yeah. me? Yeah. But you just naturally thought that because you were like a kid. You were like, I don't know. This is what people are doing. Give this a try. Yeah. Yeah. Give it a try. We'll see what happens. So, but I imagine because, you know, you were pre me too. Even though, of course, obviously we needed me to back then as well, because mm -hmm. I was yeah. also in the business just in a different way. Yeah. So for you, how was it with your representation? How was it for you creating boundaries, speaking your mind? Were you able to do that? How did you avoid getting trapped? Did you avoid getting trapped? Yeah, I I don't know how I avoided it. I, um, I kind of liken it to also being naive, which you would think if you were naive, you could get played. But I think I had this like innocence and also kindness to me that, uh, and I do believe there was like an angel on my shoulders, like guiding me. Cause mm -hmm. there were some situations that I would be just like, mm, this doesn't feel right. I didn't know why it just didn't feel right. And I would just like, leave or, you know, and, and then I, I knew what, what later I'd find out something that was to happen. Like one, one of the agents, one of my agents is a model. Like I'd never seen drugs before. I'd never seen cocaine. Like I didn't, you know, <laughs> and it's just in the movies, right. The white line. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, that was one of the months I didn't have anywhere to live. So I was, he was like, you, you can stay with me. And of course, like I never thought. <laughs> and, uh, I remember he was like, you can sleep in my bed. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I'm not going to be home th tonight or whatever, obviously. And so it was that day I'd like, I'd come in and I had saw like on the glass coffee table, like a bunch of cocaine. I was like, Shit, is that cocaine? Like what the fuck? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> and then, um, and then he got in bed that night, like with me when he got in and I just was like, got up and left and, hmm. And stuff like that, like, nope. And then grabbed my stuff and never went back and left the agency. And just, 
yeah, I just kind of um, was able to, I think what the thing is, I never put myself in anything enough for anything to happen. It was just like, mm, that goes back to my childhood of being raised just with good values. And like, I wasn't in there, I wasn't there to get into any trouble or mm -hmm. I just wanted to work. <laughs> I just right. wanted to work. And I was super focused on that. And um, that but led that's me. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, like when you think about what is required at that age to mm -hmm. just go, I'm out. Yeah. Like, and it does speak to, not to be a therapist, but I can't not be, because <laughs> it does speak to not necessarily having that original injury of abuse or of yes. sexual abuse or of, you know what I mean? Yes. Because you could recognize, I also don't have that background and yeah. found myself just in life in different situations where exactly what you just described, I would do the same, where I would just be like, I'm out of here. Yeah. And if you didn't have that kind of a background, you you are not a um like from an energetic point of view yeah. you're not a good victim even though you looked like a good victim because you yeah. were young and because you were naive yeah. but the truth is you didn't have that repeating experience you're so from right. childhood yes right yes that's exactly right i've never thought about that but you're right yeah that comes off that yeah that's right yeah it's kind of wild though, when I, when I think now, and part of why I left entertainment, well, part of it is because I wanted to be a therapist. Yeah. Um, but another part of it was the end of my career. I got into the modeling agencies and I was running TV departments for that. And the way that the models were treated mm. was just so gross. And Terrible. I just couldn't be a part of it. And I kept complaining and being like, hey, maybe we should try to not call them girls because, I mean, and this sounds like petty and stupid, but I, that's, yeah. that's where I was at. That's where I was coming in from. I was like, we're talking about women from the ages of like young girls who are girls, right? From 13 yeah. to like, we're representing Jerry Hall, who's like 65. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't think we need to be referring to her as a girl because she's a right. woman. Like, 100%. anyway, I, I would, yeah. I would go into... Katie Ford, because I was I was working, I somehow got lured back into the business, and I was running the TV department at Ford down on Green Street, and yeah. I remember going into Katie was running the agency at that point because Eileen Ford had retired obviously before then, yeah. and I remember going into Katie's office and I would complain about whatever. I would go back in and be like, "Hey, you know, the people who are supposed to be chaperones in the apartment on Forty Fourth Street are all coke addicts. They're not chaperones." Like. These are people like they're literally entrusting their children. We, yeah. we have to replace them with someone who's not a cocaine addict or whatever. Wow. And then wow. after like the fourth time I came in, she was like, Terry, let me ask you something. Do you really want to be in this business anymore? And I was like, yeah, probably not. Like she knew it. Like, And, and it was temporary because I had already gone to, I had actually already gone to NYU oh, when that okay. happened. Oh, and then went I got back. lured okay. back in. Because yeah, I was that getting happens. married. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they're like, it's only going to be two months. And then, of course, it turned into six. And I was like, no, yeah. I have to get out of here, please. Yeah. yeah. But the money is so good. It's hard to, right. you know, I mean, I was like, we can bank all this money, pay for the wedding, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I didn't realize how that all laid out for you. Um, yeah, that's, and it's, it is scary to take that leap of faith, you know, quit leaving something that, you know, is lucrative seems seems glamorous mm -hmm. um but look at you now like this is what you're meant to be doing you're changing a lot of lives and doing what you love and it's 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 amazing i'm super Aww. proud of you yeah thanks pal yeah. i'm super grateful to have made the move when i did it takes time though you know what i mean to make to to give it up and say i'll be fine without yeah the the money you know i was making a ton of money and then you're like yeah. eh did money ever really make me happy? And the truth was, it yeah. wasn't that. I was like, no, nah, it, yeah. it's not that. And I yeah. knew I'd make money. I was like, right. whatever, you know, yeah. you just, Money's, wherever you go, yeah. you're going to do it. Yeah. Money is, is freedom. You know, I've had it. I've had, haven't yeah. had it. Um, I, I prefer to have it. Even COVID. COVID has just been, whew. I mean, I still feel like I'm climbing out of this. Yeah. What happened? Like, what the heck? Like, my kids... They were supposed to, it was my daughter's last year of high school and then into college. So her last year of high school and first year of college was home. Um, yeah. I mean, the milestones so people lost. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I just tried to like be grateful. Like I get to have them like a little bit longer, yeah. just always switch yeah. to being grateful in times like that. But yeah, yeah, there's times like I've wanted to, many times I've wanted to quit acting. And for me, what I've learned, like the older I get, when I don't know what it, what to do, I just remember like, just sit still, like be quiet, go on a walk. And anytime I do that, the answers come. And anytime I try to figure it out, you know, and just drive myself crazy because I don't know, you know, it's like, Josie, just, just sit, just be still, let it, let it come to you. Right. One of, one of your, um, I've really, I've, I've got a lot, not met like in person, but through you, through watching your show the last, um, last couple of weeks, there's a couple of people that I've been doing some, I did learning some breath work from, oh, what is her name? She's, uh, Samantha Scaly. Yes. I'm obsessed. <laughs> She's the best. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And then I just, I went to one at a yoga studio it's just because I was like, okay, this is something I need. Cause meditating is really hard for me just to sit and be quiet. And so mm. doing that breath work, like just grounded me and centered me, made me feel alive. And then I felt like I could get quiet and then just let things go. So that she's amazing. Yeah. So cool. All right. Yeah. I have the last question for you. Yeah. Personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how have you overcome it? If you have. Yes. I would say the hardest boundary struggle, well, I have a couple. One is I, I struggle with conflict, with just having hard conversations. And um, have you ever heard of the Hoffman Institute, the Hoffman process? Of course. Well, I, I did that. And that was one of my biggest, I'm still working on. I was but the thing I worked on the most there is um, being okay with having you know difficult conversations. So I'm still working on that. And so I, what, what happens is I'll Oh, just let it go. You know, I'm just, and then, and then I won't see that person. Maybe I know I won't for a couple of weeks. So really just let it go because, right. but then it's one thing under the rug, right? That's, and then another thing under the rug. And then the, pretty soon that's kind of with my first marriage. I feel like we just didn't know how to communicate. We're so young too, but really communicate well. And it's just like all of a sudden there's a big pile of shit under the rug Mm -hmm. And you can't unwind when you don't deal with stuff. It's too much. And right. so, um, so yeah, so dealing with hard conversations, so it doesn't become that. And um, I don't know that I've fully gotten through that yet. So it is a work in progress. And then sure. the other thing that is, that it's sort of a play off that is that I will blow up, right? So mm -hmm. hold it and hold it. And this will be more like with my kids and I have so much patience, but, but, and they'll even yeah. say, I like, remember when mom like lost her, like, <laughs> and because it's like, I don't say what I want or how I feel. And one time, like I was so tired of always being the one that decorated for Christmas and nobody would help. But I mm -hmm. didn't say, Hey guys, I love it. If you guys, we made a night out and like tonight we just, whatever, everybody would do their thing. I would just think they would want to, and then it would be the last thing they want right. to do. So I would do it. And I, <laughs> and then I was like, I'm so over this. This is all to myself. I'm all pissed off. And then Christmas was over. And I was like, I wonder how long it'll, it'll take before someone notices that I haven't taken the tree down. So I left the tree <laughs> months, months went by nothing. <laughs> And then I was like, this is, I had like a tree upstairs, like a little tree in the, and, um, I was probably like hormonal too. And I'm like, yeah, no one notices. Oh my God. And I, and then I had to clean it. Right. And there's prickles everywhere. And I got so enraged. I threw it down the stairs. So over the banister down the stairs, <laughs> it was so, so bad. So I got to work on that. Yeah. And I'm getting, obviously I don't do that anymore, but um, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, but, just but what you're talking about though, Josie is so it's so human and it's very much what high functioning codependency is all about. We're highly capable. Yeah. We do all the things for all the people, but there is a point and there's no way of avoiding the fact that it's a one way ticket to bitter land. It just is, even yeah. though we don't want it to be, but it is, which is why that's actually the book I'm writing right now is about high functioning codependency and how we can Ooh. not do that Ooh. and speak up sooner and allow people to help us and ask for help yeah. when we need it. 
and not feel like we need to control the outcomes Yes. For all the people. We want to control the feeling states. We don't want them to feel bad. We don't want them to think bad. We yes. don't. Yes. And it's, yeah. it really impacts our relationships too. Yeah. And you're so right that all of this, these are boundary issues. So I love that, Cher. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here. You guys, you can get a signed copy of the Tickle Monster from Josie Bissett. And we're going to put all of that info. But those of you on YouTube, look how friggin' cute this thing is. Like and the book's lovely. inside there. Yeah. The, the book is inside and we have little yeah. gloves inside that look yeah. like fuzzy little monster hands. I mean, they're just, it's just adorable. I love it. So Thank anyway, you. if you need a gift, you know where to go. Yeah. I so appreciate you being on the show, my friend. I can't wait to see you in real life. We have to make plans at some yes. point. If you come to New York or if I come out West, yes. we really got to do something together. I would we love must. that. Yes. Terry, when is your book coming out? When do you? October, um, 2024. Yes. Awesome. So I, I will. Wait. Let's do a date in Seattle. Oh my I'll God. I'll come and do a book signing in Seattle. Let's do it. I love it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, my friend. So good to see you. Take care. You too, man.